Hi guys, and welcome to your first AP Stats video. This um, should be a relatively short one. Um, we are going with this first video coming from content in chapter two of the books that at this point you guys don't have yet, but you'll get them shortly. Um, the goal is to basically talk about data to start to emphasize the importance of context when you look at data that's crucial in this class that you understand what the data actually means and where it's coming from. And we'll start to play around a little bit with descriptions of data because as I told you guys, first day, making sure that um, you are being, you're communicating your findings, that's really important in this class. So okay, all we're going to do here, we're going to look at this table here, this data table as it's called, and we're going to check out the, the first of the columns. You've got player names um, without really having to recognize any of those names. I think from the years and the salary and the millions of dollars, you can at the very least know that these are um, professional players of some sort of sport. So we're going to identify the <clears throat> the five W's. Let me see, yeah, five five W's and how of this data table to help give ourselves some practice with context. Identifying the five W's and how is not something that you're going to do a whole lot in this course. This is not some sort of statistical tool. Again, it's just to get us to practice in establishing context. So who is being um, looked at or analyzed or sampled here? Well, that's pretty easy to identify from the, the first column, the player column. We've got professional players. In this case, I recognize, honestly, I'm not a big baseball fan, but I recognize uh, about 40% of those names, they are baseball players, if we want to be more specific. Baseball players, okay. And what is being looked at with regard to these players? Well, we've got two things. We've got two columns far right. We've got, <clears throat> probably most importantly, the salary in the millions for these players, along with the year of that salary, okay? So we've got two what's, two what's um, for each of these particular players. When is that data being recorded? Well, that, that we can get, thankfully, from the table um, just by looking at the difference between the highest and lowest years here. So um, we go from 1980 to 2001 in terms of when the data has been recorded. Where was this data recorded? Well. Even though we don't have this information from the table, that's okay. Not having all five W's in the how on every particular problem, that's not a bad thing. It's just good to be aware of what you don't know. One of the classic mistakes in AP statistics, um, I call it classic, in the two years that I've taught this class, I've seen this a lot. Um, don't try to make inferences about the data past what is reasonable. Um, we have no idea where this data was collected, so we're going to report that if we don't have enough info. Not enough info to know. Okay, now one thing as I go through these notes, you're going to see me really throughout the majority of the class, maybe at the tail end of the class, uh, second semester, I'll stop doing this. Often I will not use sentences that's okay. Um, there's no reason for me to draw things out. If you guys understand me with short um, clauses or just short little descriptions, I'm going to go with that. Um, however, because on the AP Stats exam, they are so picky when it comes to your descriptions and your communications, I want you, unless I tell you otherwise, I want you to always give me a description in a complete sentence. Okay? And anytime I would give you a homework key, or a test answer key, I will try to show you solutions and complete sentences as well. I want you to practice early and often with complete sentences. Okay, why was this data collected? Sort of sort of the tangent, we're getting back to this. Why was the data collected? Well, there are two, we don't know what they're using this for, so we're gonna report that, not enough info. Again, because being aware of what we don't know is just as important as being aware of what we do know. How is the data recorded? Well, there are two, we don't have enough info. is all we've got. Okay, as you go through these notes for your first time, be aware of the fact that 
um, I'm not going to say all the time, but the vast majority of the time, it's not the specific problems from the video that I want you to have a bunch of notes on. It's the, it's the ideas and understanding those ideas that will be um, quizzed on your daily quizzes. I hope that makes sense. Um, you'll see your first next time I see you guys. All right, second thing here. Um, similar problem, a company institutes an exercise break for its workers to see if this will improve job satisfaction as measured by a questionnaire that assesses worker satisfaction. Scores for 10 randomly selected workers before and after implementation of the exercise program are shown. The company wants to assess the effectiveness of the exercise program. So just like last slide, we're going to establish a context here by looking at the five W's and how. Well, who is being looked at? Who is being analyzed? Um, we've got less specific information, but we do know this much. We know that we have 10 employees for a company, and that's the best we can do. And the best we can do is sufficient. Um, what is being looked at? Okay, so the first column was the who. The next two columns um, are for what? We've got a job satisfaction index before and a job satisfaction index whoop, that X, after. Okay, easy, easy. So those are the two things we're looking at with regard to these 10 employees. When was that data collected? Well, we don't know a year. Oops. We don't know a year, we don't know a month, we don't know anything like that. But we do know the data was collected before and after an exercise program. Again, that's the best we can do. That's okay. Uh, where was the data collected? Uh, maybe you could infer that it was collected at the company. We don't really know where the uh, exercise program is taking place. Could be taking place, say, if these are 10 Eli Lilly employees, the exercise program could be on site. If it's something smaller, if maybe these are 10, I don't know, um, Speedway empo employees, probably there's not an exercise uh, facility in the back room with the meat locker or whatever. So we don't really know. We can't infer. Um, we again have not enough info. Okay, why was the data collected? Now that we do know, I think that came from the last sentence. The company wants to assess the effectiveness of the exercise program. So potentially they would want to know, is this something we want to stick with in the future? Because I assume, and I think this would be a fair assumption, the exercise program has to cost them money. Um, so is it a worthwhile investment or not? So long story short, this at the very least we know. Company wants to assess new exercise program. Okay, and how was the data collected? Well, I don't think we know that either. Um, we could make a few assumptions, but we really don't know much. There too, we have not enough info. Okay, great. So we've done, for two problems now, we've gone ahead and tried to establish a context for data in the case of individuals. Um, let's go ahead and do some defining of terms. The people we're collecting data from are called either our respondents or our subjects. So looking back at this last slide, we had 10 respondents or subjects. Looking at the slide prior, we had um, I guess one less than 14. So we had 13 respondents or subjects in the first example, okay? Um, if on the other hand, we're not collecting data from people, we would call the, the items we're care, we care to analyze experimental units. So for instance, if um, I wanna collect data on the students here at Yorktown, you guys would be respondents or subjects. If on the other hand, going back to an example I talked about in class, I want to learn about the desks in a classroom, I would call those experimental units generally. Variables take on a special meaning in statistics, which is different, I don't know that it's subtle, it's different than that of an algebraic variable. 
variables are the characteristics of our subjects we care to learn about. So let's see if from the first two slides we can identify from those tables there what the variables are. So we already established that the players are the cases or the respondents. The variables here, the characteristics we care to know about, in this case are both the year for the first slide and Good afternoon, Yorktown. Congratulations on a successful first day of school. If I could, I'd like to interrupt your block for the end of the day announcements. All right, this is going to be a little bit of a jump here. Um, it's been about half an hour since I was back to this video. So we had just talked about, it looks like, the variables from the first slide, and we had introduced the concepts of respondent subjects and experimental units. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and talk about the variables in the second slide here. Again, the respondents or subjects for this particular context are the worker numbers, 1 to 10. And then the variables would be the job satisfaction index before and the job satisfaction index after. That's the, the characteristics we care to learn about um, regarding these respondents. So let's try to abbreviate as much as poss possible. Job satisfaction whoop, index before and job satisfaction index after. Okay, all right. So we've got all the variables um, listed for these two particular contexts. Let's go ahead and look down at the bottom of the slide. We're told here, and we've talked about this in class a little bit, that variables come in two different breeds, quantitative var uh, variables and categorical variables. Easiest way to keep those straight, quantitative variables keep um, track of a quantity, categorical variables are everything else under the sun. Um, so the bold sentences we've already talked about, the variables listed above, how would you classify each in the bins below? So we want to use these four variables and sort them according to whether or not they're quantitative or categorical. So let's talk about, <clears throat> first of all, the importance of context here. I could have a variable that has numbers associated with it but is not quantitative. Think of, for instance, your um, social security number. Um, I, it's, you've got three digits, another two digits, another four digits. That's not measuring the quantity of anything, is it really? That is, for all intents and purposes, just even though your social security number is numerical, there's no quantity of something attached to it. So you would put, actually, if this were the variable of interest, your social security number would be categorical. Similarly, let's see if we can come up with another example like that. Another uh, variable for people or of things that could be categorical could be something like your zip code. Um, mine, for instance, 47304. That is, it's not a quantity of anything. It's not some number. It doesn't mean some number of zip code areas past Indianapolis or something like that. It's just a numerical designation, really a name that has numbers attached to it. So these two things that I wrote up in blue for you here is to clue you into the fact that, again, just because you've got numbers, it doesn't automatically mean quantity. Now that being said, let's be aware as we categorize first year. Well, yeah, year here, certainly measuring um, the those numbers are the number of years that have elapsed since zero, which, I mean, historically we've tied to either common era or um, Christ's, oh, what was it, um, birth, right? So year there, that's a quantity of something. That's the number of years since uh, Christ's birth or since we would measure common era. So year would absolutely be quantitative, okay? Second thing here, we've got a salary in millions. Absolutely quantitative. The number of dollars someone makes year to year. Salary in millions. Okay, I think those are pretty clear cut. However, 
I don't think that a job satisfaction, uh, excuse me, job satisfaction index before and job satisfaction index after an exercise program is as clear cut because these numbers, they're a little bit arbitrary. You don't talk about when you're really happy, you don't, you don't say, I have five happiness. Or when you're really um, unhappy, you don't say, I have one, hap uh, uh, one happiness. That's not, it's not a quantity of anything. However, that being said, um, it, it could be considered kind of a relative quantity. You could think of, let's say, and we don't know this, so I'm kind of, I am going beyond the scope of what I know about the job satisfaction index, but let's talk about different contexts that could be here. If these numbers, these numbers right here, the data for our respondents are percentages, the percent of the time that I, um, that I would feel worse than this, for instance. So for instance, for respondent three, we could have, he's, he's reporting a job satisfaction index of 50, meaning for instance, that only 50% of the time do I feel worse than this. So a high percentage is good. Conversely, if we were looking at respondent one in his job satisfaction index after the exercise regimen of 33, he would be basically be saying that only a third of the time do I feel worse than that. So he does not feel so great. So higher percentages actually could have a quantitative meaning in that case. We don't know for, for sure which way to go on this. Um, however, we were still asked to categorize these. So because we've got numbers and we're not quite sure as to how the data is being used, uh, we do know that they wanted to assess the effectiveness of the exercise program but we don't know how the numbers are being used to assess the effectiveness of the exercise program. They could be simply comparing between these two, before and after. They could be doing that. They could be doing something much more complex. So with all that being said, this particular case, the job satisfaction index before and after, is ambiguous. I would suggest that you simply categorize this in the quantitative bin when you've got numbers the data and you're not sure how it's being used. So we're going to say job satisfaction index before and job satisfaction index after are both quantitative. So we had in this particular, through this lens that we're viewing our data, we saw no categorical variables. We saw four that were quantitative. All right, so let's talk about a new type of table here. Especially when we're working with categorical variables, we'll use a lot of frequency tables. Frequency tables display counts of the categories in our variable. Um, here in the December 2000 report, so I know, bear with, we've got older data that we're using from these textbooks. The textbooks still kick butt, um, but sometimes we're going to be looking at stuff that's a little older. December 2000 report, the U.S. Census Bureau listed the levels of educational attainment for Americans over 65. What benefit do we have in using the frequency table rather than a data table for these Americans? And what info is lost in the process of using a frequency table? Okay, so I see a couple of benefits. First of all, I want you to be clued into the fact that this type of table in this slide is absolutely different than the type of table we just saw here. Why? Well, in the table that you see in front of you right now, you've got the respondents and the data corresponding to the variables job satisfaction index before and after for those respondents. So you've got all the individuals and all of their data for the variables job satisfaction index before and after. Here, um, we, have, we don't have the individuals anymore, so that's actually lost information. Oh, come on. There we go. Lost information. Individual data is now gone. Okay? But well, what's the point of doing this that way? Well, if we have organized the the table according to um, for the educational level is our variable for the 
data of no high school diploma, high school graduate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, instead of having 9,945 plus 11,701 plus 4481 plus 1390 plus 3133 plus 1213 plus 757 rows, because think about it, we were organizing all of this data according to each individual. Well, if you've got that many thousands of respondents, you would have one heck of a data table. So the frequency table, yes, you do lose individual information, but you gain uh, a concise data display. Okay, that's the first thing. And second thing, the information is organized according to the variable we care about. Um, graphic, organized, according to the variable um, education level, right? So if, if we care to know about that particular variable for these respondents, this table does a great job. It keeps things nice and simple. All right, um, last slide that we're going to look at. This video has been a little bit longer than I would have hoped for. That's okay. We'll try to cut these down as we go through. But there was plenty to establish first slide. For the description of the, or first set of notes, for the description of the data below, we want to identify the context with the five W's and how. We want to name the variables. We want to specify if the variables should be considered quantitative or categorical. And if they're quantitative, identify the units of measurement. All right, so in a study appearing in the journal Science, a research team reports that plants in southern England are flowering earlier in the spring. Records of the first flowering dates for 385 species over a period of 47 years indicate that flowering has advanced an average of 15 days per decade and indication of climate warming according to the authors. All right, so first W is who? Who is being looked at? Maybe a little bit of a, a misnomer here. In this particular case, they're telling us that we're looking at plants in southern England. So we're going to write exactly that. Plants in southern England. Okay. Who, what came next, I believe? What is being looked at? Well, they tell us that we've got records of the first flowering dates for 385 species. So we're looking at first flowering dates. Who, what, when? When is this data looked at? Well, we don't quite know that, as you can tell. But we do know that um, the data was collected over span of 47 years. Okay? So we've got our context here. Where was the data collected? Well, we've already answered that one. Southern England. Why was the data collected? I think that was told to us in the last sentence here. Um, an indication of climate warming, according to the authors, to analyze climate warming or global warming. Uh, we should be specific. If they, if they told us we're looking at climate warming, we'll go with that. Climate warming. And then how was the data collected? I don't think we have enough info. Not enough info. Okay, so the things I recommend having for your first daily quiz, make sure that you understand the types of variables there are. The, we talked about two different types of tables, data tables and frequency tables. Uh, we talked about the benefits of a frequency table, like we had here, over a data table. Um, let's see, what else? We organized quantitative, qualitative uh, data, and we, we talked about context. So there are your first set of notes. I will post, um, oh, I, I didn't tell you guys this in class. I will post a blank copy of these notes to my big campus. So you can print those that blank.